Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we have a very great webinar today. Uh, we have Brody Bazinet from Curling Canada. She's the manager of the For the Love of Curling Foundation. Um, and we're going to hear about what Curling Canada has been doing uh, in their efforts to change perceptions and foster more meaningful experiences within curling in Canada. And uh, earlier this spring, they launched their digital resource kit to support curling facilities in the collective pursuit of greater diversity and, inclusion and inclusivity. So um, without further ado, thank you, Brody, for joining us uh, for the second time. And um, please, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thanks, Monica. I'm happy to be here. And I'm uh, happy for everyone who, you know, thankful to everyone who joined potentially twice. And let's hope that I can make it doubly as impactful for you. I'm going to jump right in and share my screen, which we just did a trial run. And of course, <laughs> good. Yep, you're good. Excellent. <laughs> so, uh, as Monica said, my name is Brody Basne, and I have been overseeing, just to tell you a bit about myself, I've been overseeing Curling Canada's philanthropic program since 2017. Um, I have 20 years in fundraising and community engagement. Um, you know, this is, this is my first role in sport directly, but, um, you know, I've been involved in a variety of causes and charities from, uh, you know, sort of local up to international development type things. Uh, and I get this question all the time. So no, I am not a curler, um, but was sort of, I wouldn't say warned, but was, was told that I was going to absolutely adore the community, curling community when I started. And I have to say it has not disappointed. I've become an absolute fan of sort of the passion and the, the group that, that are running this sport. And it's fantastic. So you might look at those pullets and think sort of why me? Why am I presenting on behalf of Curling Canada? And, and we can't go page down. There we go. Uh, I think the sort of the bigger, better question might be, you know, why not me? Um, and I think everyone that is, that I've met through this group and that's, you know, that's been involved in, in sort of, in, in wanting to create change, they're not necessarily experts, right? They're just people that want to make a difference. And, you know, and that would certainly fit for me. Um, if we look at sort of the three bullets that I just shared about myself, um, you know, working in sports, whether you're volunteering or working in it, I think we can all attest to you at various times have to wear many hats. Uh, and if you come up with an idea that's even remotely a good one, it, the onus is sort of on you to, to, to see that through and to fill it. Uh, working in the nonprofit sector means that I, I do genuinely care about creating meaningful change and having positive impacts. And I think that this, you know, hands down this DEI work that that we are all as a collective sort of embarking on it is exactly that it's about making positive change. Uh, and, and this community that I'm that I'm sort of falling in love with over the last four and a half years are absolutely a community worth investing in. And so I think, you know, when you when you get that, when you see potential, you want to you want to see that through. Paging. Try going to full screen, Brody. That might help. I am full screen. There you go. Oh, there you go. OK. Okay, uh, so we're, there we go. <laughs> we're sort of only at the intro, but already uh, a takeaway, takeaway one, in my opinion on this is uh, you do not have to be an expert in this. You have to be someone who cares and wants to listen. And there's a role for anyone who wants to play, uh, play one in making change. So, so everyone that's here, you know, if you're taking on your own initiatives, I see jump in. All right, in the interest of sort of sharing and learning as a group, um, I broke this presentation down into sort of three three groups, three sections. First two are the main ones. So the first one is the, the process. I wanna take a look, I wanna walk you through sort of what we went through as an organization and sort of how that process changed organically as, as we were going through it. Um, and then of course we are gonna take take a, a high level look at the at the resource kit itself. And then as Monica said, we're gonna try to, to leave some room and time for questions because I think one of the greatest assets of this group is learning from each other and sort of sharing um, just different opinions. So uh, with that, we will we'll jump right in. So uh, focusing on process, I would say that in the sort of spring and summer of 2020, 
like many individuals and organizations, including you know sport organizations around the world and across Canada, Curling Canada was taking a look at some of their DEI processes um, and sort of reevaluating the organization. Um, we were in the midst of one of the largest social justice movements around you know in North America, and, and it was picking up momentum around the world. And so, as an organization that viewed themselves as you know naturally adaptive and inclusive just by the nature of our sport we decided we clearly needed to take stock and do some listening. So our CEO, Catherine Henderson, and our director of communications, Al Cameron, set up one-on-one -on -one consultations with 15 different external stakeholders from within the curling community. Uh, some of them had already reached out to us, uh, you know, wanting to play a role and expressing interest in, in creating some positive change. And others were people that we invited to the table that, you know, we knew we needed to hear their perspective because of their historical um, you know, input into, into areas around diversity within our sport. And it was, you know, a time for listening. And so we, that's exactly what we did. We did a lot of listening and we heard a lot of different perspectives and a lot of questions were raised in terms of opportunities within our sport, how diverse those were. So whether it was, you know, at the governance table of sport or in careers and leadership positions, um, marketing at all levels. So from grassroots uh, publications and promotions right up to curling Canada's website and stories and the TSN broadcast of our of our sport and our championships you know looking at how diver what message were we conveying uh, information sharing so how different and consistent things were from you know one club to the next from one region or province to the next um, and sort of and then in that same sort of thinking some accountability so where curlers are coming into our sport or prospective curlers are coming in at a grassroots level, as the NSO, you know, was a national sporting organization, what was our role and our responsibility and how did we ensure that there was sort of cohesive change happening at all layers of our sport? And I'd say the, the, the sort of last piece and probably one of the most valuable pieces that came out of that, these various listening sessions was, um, members on that of those external panel that were from either the BIPOC or the LBG2, LBG2 community um, were sharing some very valuable truths about their own personal perspective. And there were some consistencies in what they were sharing and it was that they had persevered in the sport. So um, they hadn't felt invited in. They hadn't felt like the the curling community was reaching out to invite them in, uh, but they had they had found themselves in a curling facility or you know participating in this sport, and had really attached to something in it that they liked, uh, even though many of them had some challenging first ex first second and third experiences, whether it was at their own curling facility, or heading on you know heading over to a bond spiel and playing somewhere else, and just sort of the reception that they were getting, and so. Um, that that perseverance piece really hit home with us on on two fronts. One being that they didn't they didn't feel they didn't feel invited in. They found their own way in, and they stayed on in our sport because of pieces that stuck with them, but not necessarily the sport and the sporting community as a whole. So we took all this information. And um, we went into what we called sort of a phase of internal reflection. We'd been gifted with some very honest and um, vulnerable personal experiences and feedback. And we, you know, you know, we've gone out of Catherine Henderson put together like 15 pages of notes from these from these meetings. And we tried to identify some common areas and issues um, and areas for improvement and taking into account our sport and the, the sort of the structure of our sport, you know, ways that we at Curling Canada could help play a role in creating this change. And we put together a high level plan that, you know, crossed many years. And I'd say one of the main things is that we set an objective um, that everything that we were going to do was going to start to become part of our daily business. So it wasn't going to be sort of these one-off projects, but it was really important to Kathy in particular that everyone looked at, at their departments and their functions within the organization and identified areas where we could just build this in to our ongoing practice. From there, we went back to group facilitation. So we, we brought the entire group back together and we sort of, we went over everything that we'd collected and we said, you know, does, does this hit home? Does this, is this capturing what, what you were conveying? Did we, did we get it right? Have we got the right feelings, the right experience? Is, are the ambitions? So some of the positive outcomes that people were looking for in our sport, are those reflected in here? And when it was all pooled together, uh, did inputs from various perspectives sort of change or enhance your view, your personal view of what's going on or what could happen within our sport? 
we presented the high level plan um, and also asked, you know, does this align with where you want to see the sport going? Does it seem realistic? Does it seem, you know, doable? Um, and left that that sort of open lines of communication. So we were heading into, you know, at this point now we're heading into the season, a season full of unknowns. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this group understood how much we valued them and their input and that we wanted to ensure that this was an ongoing process. In fact, in two weeks, two weeks, we have another, another session with this whole group to kind of report back on where we're at and what the next steps are. Drilling down a bit into the, the kit and the resources that we're here to talk about today. This was a direct outcome from those consultations. So one of the identified gaps was inconsistent experiences at community facility levels and a potential lack of resources from one curling facility to another um, in terms of their own journey to create greater diversity and inclusivity. So this was one where we kind of said as the NSO, this feels like something that we could do to create, create those resources and hand them off um, so that A, hopefully we start to see some more consistent experiences across our sport and B, um, every, every community doesn't have to recreate, right? Don't have to start from scratch. We were just talking that before we started. This group has been put together to kind of help each other out and learn from each other so that we don't have to keep starting over. We can, we can be more efficient in what we're doing. And we felt that this was an area where we could offer that um, to our curling facilities. So we put the grant proposal in and thanks in very large part to the World Curling Federation Development Assistance Program. Uh, we were successful in securing a grant and the intention of the grant and as we proposed it was to create a promotional video and a digital resource kit to foster meaningful change in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Uh, we pitched this to a larger group and invited anyone who wanted to join in to sort of become um, a much more play a hands-on role as, as a working group as we were going to now go through and develop these, these resources. Um, so five of our external stakeholders volunteered, and I'm not going to call them up by name. Some of them may be on here today. Some of them you have definitely heard from in these pan, you know, in some of the presentations and panel conversations. And you know, if they're here and they want to give a wave or they want to even share in the comments about what it was like for them to share um, and to be a part of the process, I will say that they were absolutely the key to the success as we went through this. And I cannot thank them enough um, for sharing their ideas and their feelings and sort of the good and the bad and just creating this very open welcome space to share. Um, so I, over the next uh, maybe three, three or four consultation sessions and some offline work, this working group, so there was three of us at Curling Canada and five external stakeholders, um, we set out to sort of create the framework of what would drive, would be the roadmap and the driving uh, force behind the rest of the initiatives. I cannot express how important this stage was. We did not rush this stage and it was extremely important as a group. Uh, we talked through the risks, the sort of the key messages and tone and our priority objectives. And this is where a ton of the learning as a group came. Um, you know, we were concerned, um, some of the rest. So there was cons equal concern on each end of offending or alienating ones. So if we, you know, concerns about offending the existing curling community um, and putting anyone on the defensive, uh, concerns about offending certain segments or demographics within the BIPOC community, but how we might phrase things or how we might say things or who, you know, what the visuals might be. Um, and then the other major risk that we highlighted was, as a group came up with, was diluting the message. So by trying to be everything to everyone, were we going to miss the opportunity to actually say something meaningful and important? And that was a risk that we, those two, we kind of identified as we can't bend on those. We need to make sure that we're being as open and inclusive as we can be, and that we're taking this opportunity to say something important and meaningful. Focused in on message and tone. So we wanted to make sure it was positive and inclusive. As I've said, we had already identified that this is can often be an area, you know, topic area where people are passionate and they can get defensive um, because they feel so strongly about things. And so we, we wanted to make sure that in overarching of this was positivity. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was engaging. So don't forget, we were looking at a couple of pieces of video and then this resource kit. And so we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, they were both going to be sort of engaging and people would want to watch it, want to pick it up, want to look at it. It was important that it was authentic. Um, you know, curling, 
curling thinks of itself as an inclusive sport, but what we're hearing is we're not as inclusive and maybe welcoming as we could be all of the time. And so we needed to make sure that we were, we were upfront about that we were creating these resources because we had identified that we could do better. And we wanted it to be, you know, sort of in keeping with the positive and inclusive, inclusive positive approach, we were like, this should be sort of aspirational of, of where we see that the curling could be, how the, you know, where our community could, could be in the future if we did things just a little bit better. Um, we had to set our priority objectives, right? So in, across the pieces, across all spectrums, we wanted to make sure it was diverse in representation. So from the visuals to the language we were using, it had to be diverse. We wanted to make sure that it resonated with a younger demographic. They're the future of our sport. They're inherently more open-minded and they, you know, and there, there's a greater diversity built right within that community. And so we wanted to make sure that the younger demographic was going to pick this up and see it as something that they saw themselves in. It was extremely important that we were going to profile the social and community aspect of our sport. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in our little working group that felt that that was the piece that would really resonate with members of the BIPOC community that that they were welcome, that they were wanted, and that there was this sense of community within our sport. We wanted it to be robust, but not overwhelming. We wanted to make sure that what we were offering to our curling facilities was going to be actual tools and resources, but we didn't want it to be so massive and overwhelming that they wouldn't, you know, pick it up and implement it, right? It had to be adaptable. We've got thousands of curling facilities across Canada, and of varying sizes in varying neighborhoods, you know, from you know inner city to rural Saskatchewan, um, and and each each organization could be at a different part in their own journey. So they could be starting from scratch one and deciding they want to do this. So they could be well under their way because they already have a diverse um, com surrounding community. So it had to sort of be adaptable to wherever any group might be in their journey. And lastly, it had to be implementable. So there had to be some some tangible, some takeaways, some tools in it. Um, because what, you know, we just didn't want to end up with this sort of philosophical piece uh, and then hand it off and then have these, you know, volunteer certain clubs in Canada run by all volunteers, right? The, it needed to be something that they could pick up and run with. Which brings us to takeaway number two. Um, take the time to listen with an open mind. Ask the tough questions and work together to create a plan that everyone involved can support and feel good about and it was really important and, and the kit we'll get into this in the kit a bit too it's not even so much that everyone agrees with everything that's being said or done but that everyone can support it and so by having those hard conversations um, and listening you're just setting yourself up for success okay so um from here, you know, we were headed into, we had this great framework, we had this great working group, uh, and now we were heading into the stage of sort of researching and more consultation. Um, to bring these ideas into fruition, we knew we were gonna have to take a look at what other organizations were doing within sport and beyond sport. Uh, what resources were already out there so that we, we weren't recreating from scratch and we weren't contradicting um, you know, any messages or any assets that were out there that we could use within, within the curling community and beyond. Um, so we had identified the two assets, right? The promotional video and then the resource kit itself. The promotional video, uh, working with our partners at Switchframe Media, we went through about three rounds of consultation and feedback to get to a final proposed storyboard and script. Um, because we had done the framework, because we knew we wanted this to be positive and aspirational, but authentic, uh, you know, this was actually a relatively easy process. And um, unfortunately, due to COVID and restrictions in Ontario and bringing people together, we couldn't get the ICE and a production team and our volunteer curling actors together. And so this video um, is sort of on the to be continued. Uh, and uh, it's the plan for late this summer to bring it back and make sure that we get that all finalized so that we have something to roll out for the start of the next season. Um, but then there's the resource kit itself, which we're here to talk about today. Uh, getting to a first draft and then taking that first draft to, to design layout took eight additional separate rounds of review and consultation, eight separate. And each of them uh, those changes were implemented before we went on to the next round. So we had the two unique working groups of Curling Canada staff. We had the group of three, and then we had an extended group with four additional staff members. We had two distinct circles of curling facility managers who were making sure we were covering off sort of the, the breadth of what a curling club might, the makeup might look like. 
Uh, we had a professional in HR and diversity specialist. We had another professional in sport and leadership and community studies. We had this in external working group of five. And then of course we did a final round you know, with our director of communications, just sort of dot the I's across the T's. And I share this not to give us a pat on the back at all, uh, with the exception of Maddie Kelly at Curling Canada, who held the digital pen to not only do the research and pull together the first draft, but to sort of implement all of these rounds of review and consultation. And it was, you know, Maddie did an exceptional job, um, it, but it really was, it was the feedback from everyone as we went through this. And it was, you know, some of it was very constructive and helpful and but the majority of it, it was just really positive um, that we were we were taking the step to have this and we were positioning it in a way that you know everyone felt that you know the curling community would want to pick up and run with it. So takeaway number three. <laughs> it's the last one, I promise. Embrace the idea that you will not know everything, nor is any one perspective absolute or superior to all others. Open up avenues for participation and input wider and grander than you might think is necessary or beneficial. And I can tell you firsthand, I wish looking back, we had had more voices at the table. I don't necessarily wish we had done more rounds, but I wish we had had a more an even more diverse representation. But I was nervous about this. I was trying to figure out how we were going to take, you know, even the like five to 15 at various points voices and roll them in. Um, but I think because of, because of the framework was laid out and because we were clear on what we were trying to accomplish, the feedback was, was just so helpful and constructive. And, uh, for them, like I said, for the most part, positive that, uh, any hesitations that I had, I, if that's the, if that's kind of the one thing you take away, don't have them bring the voices in, um, listen to what people are saying, because, you know, people that are standing up to say something, it's because they care and, and they're offering something valuable. Okay, we're at, we're at resource kit time. Uh, so on March 21st, 2021, uh, the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and in the week around it is when, you know, when we launched um, the digital resource kit. Uh, so the website went up, we had some social media, we had a media release, we had members of our external panel sort of be the face in the name of some of this, and, um, you know, and we, and we were very fortunate to get some good traction on it. We created the full resource kit that you could download as a whole. Uh, we created uh, some, some sort of campaign overarching social media graphics. So they were very much based on this curling as a place for everyone, creating meaningful change. Um, the intention with the video, which will still happen, was that we were gonna create a series uh, of social media assets so that you, so that any, you know, depending on your community makeup and what you might wanna see, you know, you could pick and choose, but for, for this, purposes of this launch, they were very sort of inclusive and all encompassing and had multiple images. Uh, and we created um, some posters. So it's, it's essentially two posters, just size different. They're, they're, you can customize them and print them right in your own curling facility. There's a space where you could include either, you know, what your diverse, your DEI committee might be or new league nights or, you know, so these were just some simple sort of assets uh, that were eye catching and engaging. And we thought brought, you know, sort of some nice, almost curb appeal, if you will, to a very important issue. The next piece, um, I should back up, sorry. So the, the full resource kit, because it being implementable um, and not overwhelming was extremely important to us, we also chose to break the kit down into nine sections. And so on the landing page, you know, where you can get all of these resources, you can actually download one of nine, all of nine of the whole kit, but you could jump in at any one section. And this is how we, this was our, our answer to sort of making it adaptable, depending on where you might be in your own journey within your curling community and facility. So now we're going to jump in back in uh, to the sections themselves. So one of the sections, uh, the importance of diversity, you know, we, we took a look at this and wanted to sort of position it from both perspectives. So yes, it's a great business opportunity for sustainability within your curling facility. Uh, there is revenue generation, uh, you know, potential and, and growth in terms of, you know, more curlers, more volunteers, more spectators. Um, but the flip side of this, and, and that's an important piece, right? That's the sort of business of curling aspect of this. Um, 
but the sort of doing what's right and the human value is, is this is just great value add for the facility and every curler's experience within your facility. Um, and so we, you know, we really, this, this, this section goes over both of those, those aspects. Um, and, and starts, starts to focus in on, and we'll get, it gets more into, into the marketing section about sort of the perception of our sport within your community. And so starting to change that perception. We created a definitions and education resource section um, because, you know, it was our, it was our sort of perspective that that is what can stop people from getting involved, right? This concern of, of not getting it right, of not knowing enough, of not saying the right thing, of not using the right term. Um, and so if you're going to create a space, a safe space for sharing, um, then, you know, maybe it starts with with some self-education as an individual who might be jumping into this or, or as, you know, as your entire curling, curling facility board or staff makeup. Um, Cause I think that that's what empowers people to be able to sort of create positive change and stand up and, and say things um, is sort of knowing where they, you know, knowing some of the right terms or, you know, some of the, and, and, and the resort, the, the educational resources, there's like free resources to go through, to learn. It's almost like I've said, it's like a, a rabbit hole. You can just keep going down and down and one leads to the next. And there's so many things that you can sort of delve into. So we sort of recapped it here and it, and it's, um, I will say there's some resources that it's a broader scope than, you know, just ethnic diversity. There's um, women in sport and um, sort of the makeup of your communities. And so it's a nice, robust set of, uh, set of resources there. Unconscious bias. Uh, this is probably the shortest section per se of the nine, um, but such an incredibly important one, important one. Um, you know, this is sort of our becoming aware section. And the thing about unconscious bias is, you know, we all have it. We are a makeup of all of our experiences and our learnings to date and what we've heard and seen. And, um, and that's okay. That's absolutely natural. Um, but becoming aware of it and recognizing when we might be making some leaps um, unintentionally is, is really important to be to having a more open mind. And um, yeah, so that is a short section. The main piece of this is, uh, you know, we can't really take the credit for it, but Microsoft has this fantastic uh, walkthrough sort of training. It's free and it's, it's just a really positive and eye-opening uh, resource that you can use to sort of start to recognize some of our own unconscious bias. Engaging your board. So this is a section that um, similar to how we had those conversations and designed our, our framework. Um, and that was so important and integral to how everything else rolled out. Um, this is sort of in that same vein where you want to have those conversations and, and they need to be free of judgment and they need to recognize that there are going to be a varied perspectives at the table. Um, and if you're, if you're going in with the intention of just changing someone's mind, uh, you may not have the best outcome, but if you're going in to listen and everyone is open-minded um, that there are different possibilities and different perspectives, then hopefully and ideally you can come up with a plan that again, everyone can support. Right. So even if it's not exactly how you might do it, you can see the value in how it's being presented and shared. And then you can stand behind it because you really need your board uh, behind you in some of these changes that you may want to be making at a curling facility level. A targeted approach. This is by hand, hands down the most robust section of the nine. Um, this is when you've already sort of done some of your learning and you've engaged at your board and you're ready to roll because it is really the roll up your sleeves and get at her. Um, there's lots of recommendations about how to get to know not only your curling membership makeup, uh, but the, the demographics and the makeup of the surrounding community. And to ask yourself some of the hard questions about does your current makeup reflect your community? Is there room for improvement? Are you, you know, are you representing what you want to be in this sport? Um, it offers su suggestions on sort of internal processes and committee structures and makeup. So, you know, maybe it's not, you know, three welcomers or greeters, uh, maybe it's an entire panel of like 20 or 30 people. Um, and they're not, and, and some of that suggestions and training is that they're not just there to, to welcome and greet new members into the club, but to actually get to know them and learn about them. So not just selling the club, the curling facility, but but getting to know them and why why there may be a good fit for them or why they may you know come to enjoy the sport. 
Uh, there's also some tips, tips and processes. Um, so mission and vision statements, code of conduct, and there's some sample templates in there. So this one really is the sort of the homework, if you will, of the entire kit. Being responsive, part one. So looking at, uh, you know, like our like Curling Canada's business of curling uh, makeup, we, you know, we encourage you to look at different membership options. Obviously, we want financial sustainability within all of our curling facilities. But when you look, so you've done the homework and you've looked at sort of the makeup in your community and is and if it's reflective in your club, is there room to to offer some some different memberships um, that would be more appealing to to a younger demographic, to a more diverse demographic? Um, you know, is it, are there options that would encourage group participation? So family memberships or volunteer memberships. So membership options that, that would immediately get a new curling club member um, more engaged in this community aspect and in the sport, sort of the off ice, if you will. New program ideas. So again, you know, this is sort of being responsive part two and, and just goes over the importance of having a variety of beginning programs, you know, so that they're varied by either age or by night or by season. So, you know, maybe some in between seasons, maybe it's a really short season that, but enough that allows a, sort of a newcomer to the sport to, to get to know the game, but to get to know the facility and the members is really important. Um, you know, so one of the suggestions that we heard from this, this one came directly from one of our sort of clubs, one of the groups that we were sharing with is, you know, create a new members event that actually celebrates diversity. So not just sort of, um, you know, it's not that it's just happening off the side of anyone's sort of list of pro priorities, but acting with, you know, great intention to, to sort of make this a priority and a welcomed one and one that current members and sort of, you know, can, can embrace and be a part of and see the value in it. There's an updated curling 101 manual link in there. Um, and we are checked the shortest sessions. So marketing resources, right? This was, this is a big one. This is sort of the one that got flagged for us and why we even headed down this road. And so um, this section encourages curling facilities to take a look at uh, sort of all avenues of communication. So not only the very obvious ones, uh, you know, like your website, like your social media platforms, and those are absolutely where you should start. Um, but this sort of goes beyond that. So, you know, it even goes beyond the decor, you know, what's what's being shown on the walls and, and then gets into a whole nother section that is um, about acting with intention and intentional outreach within the community. So um, looking, seeking opportunities to bring curling to represent our sport uh, at events or you know within the community where there could be great linkages where where by simply being at a parade or at a festival or you know at a, a trade show or you by being there um, in a in a place where you maybe wouldn't necessarily think of an automatic fit for curling you're already portraying to your community that you're open that you're welcoming and that you want to create new connections Uh, reciprocal partnership. So in, in a similar, so building on sort of that intentional outreach, if you go through the kit, you're going to see the word authentic repeatedly, but this is, is one area where um, based on feedback is where we really brought, you know, brought that to the forefront. And I think um, in any good business relationship, you want to make sure that, you know, both parties are seeing value and receiving value. Uh, and this is one where we were like very adamant that if you're going to go and try to create new relationships sort of in, whether it's for sponsorship or ice rental times or, you know, create some new revenue driven um, opportunities that it was absolutely authentic, that what you were looking for um, is going to benefit those that you're looking to bring into your club or those businesses as much as it's gonna benefit the curling facility. And so this is one that just says really slow down, get take the time to get to know the leaders within your community and really understand what their goals and objectives are and, and try to find the common grounds and, and ensure that there is a, a reciprocal partnership and a good fit for both. Um, so that's the kit. Those are the nine sections. And uh, this is the link where you can go and see the, uh, you know, you can drill down into any and all of these. Um, the next rounds, as I said, are going to be to create the video. Um, which, you know, which is on the books and should be happening uh, and then create an entire, a series of social media assets that, um, 
you know, that again, that you could kind of pick and choose and adapt as, as appropriate for your, for your club. And we're quite early. We're into the questions and comments and feedback section. So I'll hand it over to Monica. Thank you so much, Brody. Um, it was great to kind of walk through the entire kit. I've looked at it, but I, I didn't know all the details. So that was really informative. Um, we're open for questions now. If anyone wants to pop them in the comments, the chat, or submit them through the Q&A um, feature, or you can also raise your hand and I can allow you to share your video and speak. Um, completely up to you what avenue you take with that. Um, and as you guys are submitting your questions, I had a few actually. Um, so Brody, you've worked with us a fair amount with the global initiative. You've attended a lot of our sessions. I'm just kind of curious, like how Curling Canada has set up their organizational structure in terms of working on DEI efforts. Um, is there a point person who's kind of leading the effort or is it kind of a group effort? Yeah, great question. At, at this point, I would say it's a bit of a group effort, um, you know, it because it does cross so many functions within the organization. So, uh, you know, Al Cameron is is very hands on involved, especially with this sort of extended uh, consultation panel. Um, but it's something that we've that we're working on in terms of identity. So we're just sort of heading we're, our fiscal year is, you know, May 1st. And so we're just heading into our planning, if you will. Um, and it's been identified at both a governance and an operations level. Um, you know, we're asking those questions. Do we need a pointed person uh, to be that, you know, to be, to be the, the point of contact in addition to ensuring that it's sort of integrated and built across all platforms? Um, you know, it was one of the feedbacks, that, one of the pieces of value of feedback that came back was, do we, do we, do we recruit an ambassador? For diversity and inclusivity within our sport that is you know a high profile uh, sort of has the name recognition and has some some additional reach you know that's been brought up as you know do we start to go that road as well so i think right now we've we're just sort of laying the groundwork of making sure that it's across all platforms in in our sport um in our operations of our sport and then and then where do we go from there great um we do have a couple questions here um so from dave we are in the beginning phases of generating a new business plan for our club the committee members would would benefit from getting this information. What would be the best way to introduce this topic to the committee? Ooh, good question. Um, so, I mean, you need someone who cares, right? So Dave, you'd probably be the one to say, maybe you'd want to sit this down. I think if you look at the resource kit and, and delve into the why is diversity important, you may find some nuggets that are going to really resonate, you know, with your committee. Um, separately it you know we can we can certainly assist you know I, I just took five club curling uh, facility managers in northern Ontario through the kit so a slightly different perspective right we just we didn't get into the how or why we just went right into the kit and why it would have positive impacts you know for their curling facility so we could certainly assist in that way as well great um uh, Ray asks, uh, within Curling Canada, how diverse is the organization currently and are there plans to recruit a more diverse workforce fo moving forward? So second question first, yes, there absolutely are. One of the pieces that we did coming out of the sort of consultation rounds was um, an audit, right? A diversity audit, so on staff and governance um, to identify sort of where we fit in this. And, you know, aside from just looking at faces around the table, we knew we weren't overly diverse in some areas. Um, but of course, doing this audit brought forward some interesting backgrounds of people that we may not have known without the audit, but it absolutely flagged for us. Um, and we're, we're undergoing, so we're working with um, an HR consultant, um, because you know we want to ensure that there's more diversity at the table and that we're being intentional in how we recruit um, so that we can bring you know new voices to the table and certainly in the sort of the leadership of sport. So we're not there yet, um, but it is you know absolutely getting better. you know a couple of our most recent hires you know, nicely nicely fit into a more diverse um, a more diverse representation. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean we might have to have you back for another webinar. So you can tell us the further progress that you've made over time. Um, Darren asks, um, if you're a, mem a curling facility member or a board member in a facility and you use some of these materials or approaches, what support is there for following up or networking with other facilities on what is working and what isn't working? Right, so that's like the biggest question in curling about anything that we're doing or, you know, 
we have the resources online. We're we're trying to create, we're working with our member associations, right, at the provincial and territorial support level too. So they've gone through the training, they've gone through some DEI training, you know, with our consultants. Um, we are trying to, we will be creating um, that same type of DEI training as a webinar. I think over the summer, there's five that are rolling out um, that, will, that will be available, um, but it's so challenging and that's not just this this topic area right like it's so challenging to figure out who's doing what out there that's working well and how do we then share that with everyone how do we even identify that it's happening so i don't know share share on social media share with us share with your member association so that you know when you have something that's working well um you know kind of put your hand up and say hey you know here's a resource that could work yeah um another question along the same lines um so what are the next steps for Curling Canada with regards to DEI? So you've got the toolkit, you've got the promotional video in works, but the work never stops, right? So um, what do you see as being the next phase or phases in this work? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's, there's like, I should review that entire list that Kathy's got going. There is quite the list, uh, but the sort of, I would say outward facing, very tangible ones would be um, the training that we just did a month ago with our member associations they were open to eds and like all staff at, at the facility uh, sorry at the M M member association so uh we ran through that and we're going to um adapt that and get it up online as a free resource for any club any curling facility whether it's volunteers staff um the next piece is we were planning a uh changing the face of curling summit um that was, it's been, it's been postponed. It's kind of been pushed twice because of COVID. Uh, so it's, it's intended to happen in, in sort of 2021, 2022 series. Um, again, bringing together sort of some leaders in the, in the sport across the country. And the intention with that is to make that adaptable as well. And so to pull out the sort of key messages and takeaways and, you know, make sure we're videoing that so that it is then available as a free resource for our curling, curling community afterwards as well. That's great. Yeah, I'm excited for that. I've heard a bit about that myself. Um, as a similar question, this, this kit is a great starting point for change, but how can Curling Canada as the NSO check whether clubs and associations actually strive for diversity? How do you hold them accountable? Yeah, right. That was one of the pieces of feedback we got. And it's one of the things that, you know, we're trying to figure out. And I think even as an internal group here, we've discussed it, you know, between Monica, Sarah and I is, the way our structure and our sport is, you know, we're sort of the three tiers and there is a, a sort of, if you will, a lack of accountability, right? There's no, uh, there's no stick. There's no like do this or there's this consequence. Um, and we've been, you know, over the last year and a half, two years, we've been, we've been sort of going back and forth between creating sort of a standards, right? Uh, you, you know, where if you're your gold star standard or a platinum standard, if you, if you do all these things, and, you know, and I've, I've done a bunch of consulting consultation on that and have landed in a space where um, the last thing we want is curling facilities going through an exercise to simply check a box and get a star. Right. Um, and so where we're leaning more towards now is creating some of these best practices uh, and running these seminars. And um, if we can come up with sort of an ambassador system. And so I think the more we can change um, the important, the perception and the importance of having um, greater diversity and being more open in our sport, then the more onus is going to come on the club simply from the community itself, right? Um, you know, if, if we're out there as a national sporting organization saying, here's, here's who we are, here's what we represent, here's all of the, you know, all the work we're doing in this. And if you're a curler in, I'll pick my, my own town just because, you know, if you're a curler in, in Rockland, Ontario, and the three clubs, the three curling facilities closest to you aren't doing that, then there's a bit of onus on me as well to, to step up and say, hey, why aren't you doing that, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, this is a, a great question, a good idea actually. Um, is there any plan to make resource the resource kit in other languages so that different demographics and cultural groups can understand easily and associations outside Canada can use the resource guide as a template? So when we, um, and this speaks partially to the video as well, uh, when we were planning this and creating it, um, we knew we were going to do it both in both French and English. So we will we'll be producing the video in French and English as well. But the in, the logic behind it in working with the grant with the World Curling Federation, uh, you know, this is a little more specific to the video, was that we were going to ensure 
it was visuals with entirely voiceover. So, um, so we didn't have to have dubbing and there wasn't going to be, so that it could be translated and then the voiceover could be done in any language uh, necessary. The resource kit is a lot of words. Um, at this point, we don't have immediate plans to do that, but because it, it literally, you know, it's, it's Word docs and PDFs, um, the exception of the sort of the educational resources, the, the, the gist of the kit could be uh, for sure. Um, and I think maybe if we started working within any of our sort of regional areas where the, that became an identified need of a, of a specific, you know, language, then, then we could, we would be open to that. Yeah. I, I love that idea. Um, another question from curling Canada's point of view, will the emphasis on returning to the, to the sport post COVID-19 help or hinder specific DEI initiatives? From Curling Canada's perspective, it will not hinder them. I will tell you that was, there was some feedback from a, at the curling, the grassroots level that said, listen, this is a lot to take on. We're, we're just trying to get member, our, our, you know, our previous members back in the door. Um, so I think, there, it, I think it's really in how you sort of frame or your perspective on this, right? So yes, we want, our, we want members back in. Our, our clubs need to become full and sustainable, but... I don't think that adding, you know, a more open perspective on your marketing or, you know, your logic or your thinking or, or new member, like all of those things to me support good business of curling practices. Um, so from our perspective, it won't hinder them. Um, and then it, it'll be, it'll be interesting, let's say, to see at, at sort of a grassroots level, what that actually, what that actually does. Yeah, I, I personally agree with that. I think it's actually a great opportunity. Um, that we're presented with here. Um, Ray is asking, have you been working alongside organizations such as USA Curling who have done a phenomenal job in the past year to promote DEI? We have not, but we could. Monica, we should do something. We'll do something, yeah. Um, and that's all I'm seeing from folks. If Please submit your questions if you, if you have any. And um, Sarah and Raju, please jump in if you have anything yourself. Yeah, if I can jump in. Um, Brody, can you share a little bit about how Curling Canada is thinking about measuring impact? Uh, like, are you tracking who's using the resource kit and like how they're using it? So, uh, you know, with Google Analytics, like we can see downloads of the kit and so we can track that way. Um, once the video is up and running, you know, some of those measurables through social media, we could. Um, I don't know how telling that would be, right? When we get down to that same accountability level and, you know, in terms of who's actually running it. What I can say is one of the plans for Curling Canada, and this is a, a done, this is, I can share this because it's in the works and um, we are hiring a new position. So a club development manager um, position that will work directly under Danny Lamaru as, as sort of the director of championships and grassroots club development. And the hope would be that again, instead of honoring the structure of our sport and working with our member associations, that we could create some more direct linkages with grassroots organizations. Um, you know, but right now, the way we sort of operate is we will create, doesn't have to even be the DEI resource kit, but you know, we'll create youth curling programs. Uh, and then, you know, we roll those out to our provincial and territorial sporting organizations. And then they roll that out and implement it at a grassroots level with curling facilities. And so that tracking and that accountability across our sport is, is a challenge. Um, and, it, and it's predominantly anecdotal, right? And, and so you tend to hear from the very positive or the very, very not so happy. Um, but, you know, so, so where we get, where we get a sense of what's going on is, is when, when facilities will write back or, you know, let us know, like, I'm using this, I have some questions. And so we're hoping is, that we can be a bit more intentional and forward, you know, outward reaching when we have that that position in place so that we can create some of those relationships and, and get a better understanding of what's actually happening. But unfortunately, you know, we don't even have, we don't have a national database, right? A national registry in, in Canada of, of curlers. And so even if there were a way to start building that in, uh, we just, we don't have that. We were dependent on, on sort of information, demographic information coming up from grassroots to the member association to us. So not easy. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> you'll have to keep us updated on how that goes. Um, 
we had an anonymous question. Um, is there a reason why Curling Canada did not make a statement around anti-racism or publicly supporting racialized communities during this season? So I would say that um, probably more of an Al Cameron question, to be honest, but um, we went back and forth with Oh, we went back and forth on this issue and I, and I think the underpinning of a lot of it was some authenticity. So um, we wanted to, it was really important that as an organization, we felt we were being authentic to the message. We did not want to sort of jump on, if you will, a bandwagon or a movement to simply um, make a statement, right? Um, for the sake of making a statement. And so when we were trying to wrap our heads around issues around diversity within our sport and we were comparing it to other sports and we were trying to figure out um you know did we have was was this a very was this a red flag huge alarm for us um we were we just we were trying to find a place where we could authentically state who we were as a sport who we wanted to be um and you know and what our what our issues with with diversity in the sport were and so um so I think it, it, I think it just came down to more of wanting to make sure that when we did say something, we were saying it in a manner that worked for us at all levels of our sport. Thank you. Um, another question, you mentioned Curling Canada is in the process of structuring their DEI team. Is there already somewhere or someone within Curling Canada that curlers can, curlers can ask or get help from to start their DEI journey in the clubs? That would be you, you, right, Brody. I'm like, if it start with me, and at the very least, you know, depending on what what area or what the question might be, I may be be able to pull someone else in. Um, I think that might might be the best starting point at, right now. Yeah. And I, I did send the link out to the website um, to all the attendees, so everyone should have that. So you can go to that at your own time. Um, just kind of curious, so during your consultation stage, <clears throat> what were some of the biggest asks of the folks that you consulted with? Like what, what did they identify as like the main starting points for Curling Canada or the main needs? Oh, so the early consultation. Yeah. Um, I would say it was probably to really listen, like to pay attention. Like, so I, you know, our sport, it's one of the pillars of our sport is inclusivity, right? Like we're adaptable, we're inclusive, we're inclusive by nature. And I think if I were to sort of, that sort of underlying was, you can't just sit back on your laurels anymore and accept that the sport is inclusive by its nature. There has been a lack of intentional outreach. Um, and so I think if, if really, if I were to, to drill down on any one of the sort of what's your leader, you know, what are the leadership, like any of the specifics, when you get right down to it, it was, um, you need Curling Canada as, as the national sporting organization, you need to be intentional in your outreach and in what you were doing and how you were framing um, what's happening. Because while there may not be these glaring, um, locker room racial like you know these awful situations it's not ideal so let's let's all just open our eyes and authentically accept that and and work towards creating something better sarah raju do you guys have anything and going oh go ahead sarah sorry oh there's a new question in the from jeff so go with that one first uh, Jeff's asking, have you had conversations with your broadcast partners, such as TS, TSN, about how they can share some of the work that Curling Canada is doing in the sport, or how they can better highlight some of the athletes that are, in fact, diverse and share their story? So uh, conversations about how they could share the work we're doing, I would say no, not really. Um, but conversations about how we work together to um, create a better profile, like to profile some of the diversity in this, more diversity in the sport, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've heard it right on some of the other panels, you know, presentations we have too. We, we also wanna be a bit cautious of any sort of tokenism as well, right? And so at the elite level of our sport, there is not, um, there's not an overabundance of 
a visible diversity, right? And so I just think that it's a sensitive area. And I think where, where we've identified that we sort of can have some real positives is is highlighting some of the grassroots diversity through our broadcast. So, you know, working with our broadcasters to tell more stories. Curling Day in Canada is a prime one, right? Like we highlight that's entirely about grassroots. And so um, those conversations are happening, but, but not necessarily about highlighting the work that we're doing. Um, Ivan asks, are the member associations ready to support facilities with implementation? So the member associations um, are all going through sort of their own process as well, right? So we've we've worked with we've we've offered some DEI training um, sessions with them. They of course have this resource kit and have you know full access to sort of anything you know any of the resources at Curling Canada. And, but you know, like we were speaking before this even started. They, they're in there setting up their own consultation panels and, and wanting to ensure that the voices within Alberta are heard and represented. And, and then, and then right curling grassroots curling facilities are doing the same. And so to sort of, it, it, there's no doubt it's going to be challenging to, to align some of these thoughts and voices and, and, and to support each other and ensuring that we sort of all get it right. But if we can just get it better, if we can all just get a bit better than what we're doing right now and start taking steps. So the member associations, it's absolutely on the radar, both from a governance and an operations perspective. I know from National Curling Congress last year, you know, this was a topic that repeatedly was coming up from, you know, the presidents of, of the boards at the MA level saying like, we need to do this, we need to be proactive, we need to, to jump on board. And so I, I hope they do. They certainly are being supported from us. And this is not to pass the buck. They are being supported from us where we're saying, what else do you need? How else can we support you? And I think the problem is you don't necessarily know what you don't know until you get into it, right? So as they're going on this journey themselves, I think there may be some, you know, some new gaps and new, uh, you know, new sort of issues identified and, and new positives where we could maybe work with them to support them. Is there kind of an escalation process for, you know, if, some, if there's an issue at the member association level regarding DEI of any type? Um, is there kind of an escalation process where Curling Canada would get involved or um, step in or hold people accountable to some of these things that you're putting out with the resource guide? So most like, like Curling Canada has at national, you know, within our organization it doesn't, it's not about being national or provincial, but like we have our own sort of governing policies and we have our own um, escalation, if you will, right. Where if there's issues where on a, on a variety of levels, um, you know, there's third party reporting that can happen. There's reporting at a board level. So I know that all of our member associations have a similar, you know, at their level that's sort of at their jurisdiction and set up as their own policies and practice and procedures. Um, I don't off the top of my head and not being involved in governance, I wouldn't want to say a hundred percent when and where, or if curling Canada would get involved, but I would say that there are absolutely processes at the provincial territorial sporting level that would have to be followed first. Makes sense. And I mean, kind of looking, going back to the statement question, um, does, do you think curling Canada would ever be in a position where they'd feel comfortable making a statement given through like the past year and everything that you guys have been through and that you've learned? Um, is that something you'd consider in the future? I wouldn't say that it, that we wouldn't consider it. I just think we would have to really, um, yeah, we'd have to, it would have to be, you know, well thought through and we have to see the positives. Like, I think whenever you're going to do something like that, you know, in our, in our small working group panel had some of these conversations as well, where you, you, you don't want to not do something, you know, we never want to do something out of fear base. So you don't want to not make a statement or not create a resource or not, you know, create a commercial or whatever um, for fear of how it will be perceived. But I do think you have to talk and think through those risks and think through what is the best outcome you want to have here. And so if we were going to make some type of statement, um, I think we would have to really identify what we were hoping the outcome of making that statement would be. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm not saying we wouldn't, I'm just saying that that would probably be where we would have to land before we would do something like that. Makes sense. Um, we have time for one last question. Uh, what has changed with Curling Canada's internal demographics? What has changed? Yeah. As in the recent hires or? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <not> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
we all got a little bit older this year. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't, I, you know, without wanting to call anyone out or, or sort of, you know, pinpoint someone, um, you know, we've identified through the audit process, you know, we've identified that a certain number of, you know, LBGTQ members, community members that are on our staff and board. Um, what came out of the audit was, you know, a, a couple of sort of Indigenous heritage backgrounds that, you know, that we wouldn't, I guess, weren't really aware of or was, wasn't necessarily shared. Um, you know, the, two of the most recent hires, one on a term and one as a, as a permanent position, are uh, both are visible minorities. Um, and so, you know, add a nice different perspective, uh, you know, to the operations table and a voice to the table. But I don't know. Can yeah. I know? This process takes time and maybe that's not even a direct, you know, measure of all the work that you guys are doing too. So um, any last questions before we end this session? Well, um, thank you so much Brody for um, presenting the resource guide and hopefully everyone can take advantage of, of those resources and um, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any more questions, but um, thank you guys and, and happy Pride Month, happy June. Um, we'll see you at the next, the next webinar. So have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.